Hello brothers and sisters, this time I would like to make a video about the first and second chapter of the book A Journey to the Earth's Interior by Marshall B. Gardner, written in 1920. In these chapters we will analyze the findings and research of Mr. Gardner and compare to today's findings of astronomy. You must understand that the same forces that make us believe in the lies that they call history at school, like 9-11 and the Holocaust, that they also control the information flow at NASA and the official astronomy knowledge. The officials at NASA keep altering the photos that come in from the cosmos and give us a false interpretation of how cosmogenesis really works, like the formation of planets and stars. According to Gardner's book, the Earth is a hollow body with an inner Earth and Sun. The Earth's crust is around 800 kilometers thick with two openings in the North and South Pole. First a short introduction from the book A Journey to the Earth's Interior by Marshall B. Gardner. This is the book A Journey to the Earth's Interior by Marshall B. Gardner. Here is the table of contents. We will analyze the first two chapters of the book in this video. Introductory. An author who puts forth a new idea must expect to meet with opposition and be ready to, fend, to defend his idea vigorously. He knows that the great mass of people is very conservative, especially in its habits of thought and that it is inclined to take many things, the shape of the earth for example, as proven once and for all. But he also knows that the great reading public, even more than the specialists in science, is open-minded and willing to give a fair hearing. He will expect some opposition and some misunderstanding but he may also expect a slow, perhaps but sure, volunteering of support. A new idea and plea for its fair hearing. The author of the present work has set forth in it a theory which is not only new than it in itself, but not, but not necessarily cause opposition in a world which is always hungry for some new thing. But it is a theory which involves the denial of a number of ideas which are old and widely held and often held by people who do not understand their bearing. These people will defend them with such weapons as ridicule or perhaps misrepresentation. The trained scientists and the average reader, from trained scientists, on the other hand, the author expects to meet with greater prejudice than from the public, but he does expect that any criticism they may have, have to make upon his theory will be made from a purely scientific standpoint, that his idea will not be dismissed simply because he's not a professional explorer or astronomer. Or fortunately, scientists often do this. They have their professional Freemasonry. If you're not one of them, they do not want to listen to your theories. But the man in the street, the author wishes to say this. There is not in the whole course of this book a single statement that is not backed up by the actual experiments, observation, discoveries and reports of the same scientists. They cannot claim that the theory expounded in this book is unscientific theory, for every bit of it is solidly based upon their own findings. Our theory may be untrue, but if it is, then the findings of Nansen and every art other Arctic explorer, or Sir Robert Ball, Percival Lowell, and every astronomer are wrong. For upon the work done by these men and upon no other consideration whatsoever than those of pure scientific knowledge are his, the ideas in this book built. What Marshall B. Gardner states here is fact. In today's world, we cannot bring in a new idea in the area of science unless you have made it through the official institutions like college and universities. That is true for all academic fields. In the area of engineering, as an example, anti-gravity and other and ether physics is suppressed. Nikola Tesla is a good example of how the modern technological suppression works and is done to this day globally. In the area of medicine, alternative cures for cancer are suppressed. Just mentioning Isiac and cannabis oil. Official, official Western medicine denies the existence of soul body or the etheric body denies that we have auras, although it has been made visible using Kirlian photography, and it also denies the existence of the chakra system that connects the auric field to the inner, finer body or soul. It is all interconnected. If there is a suppression in all these fields, then it is logical to assume that official astronomy is also filled with lies and deception. They tell us that we have evolved from some random soup of atoms millions of years ago, that before this incredible universe came into existence, there was literally nothing, and then this nothing just exploded in the course of billions of years out of this chaos, orders came into existence. And that this existence, this order, came out of nothing and chaos. This is what they tell us. 
believe that the I believe that the universe is a living entity, another type of life form other than human or plant life, but that it is alive. In this universe, planets and stars are formed continuously. Now we will read about the gravitation and the Hell Earth theory of the book by Marshall B. Gardner. Gravitation and our theory. The answer to this is that the gravitational pull is not the geometrical position that counts. Center in the geometrical sense of the word does not apply. It is the mass that attracts. And if the great mass of the Earth is in its sixth shell, it is the mass of the shell that will attract, and not a mere geometrical point which is not in the shell at all, but 200 900 miles away from it. And that is the approximate distance between the center of the Sun and the inner surface of the Earth. As a matter of fact, it is the equal distribution of the force of gravity all through the shell that keeps the Sun suspended in a spot which is equidistant from every part of that shell. When we are on the outside of the shell, it is the mass of the shell that attracts us to its surface. When we go over the inside of the shell, the same force will keep our feet solidly planted on the inner side. So we walk on our heads on the inner world and the mass attracts. So the mass of the shell of the earth attracts us. The final test, that it will stand this test, that the interior of the earth will be opened up to our exploration and traffic and observation of we have made in this book open up to thought, it is our confident belief. Now we will read some parts of the second chapter. In this chapter, Marshall B. Gardner tries to explain to us that the small suns are encapsulated by matter, by matter in planetary nebulas. That it is an ongoing process of planet creation. Um, let's start reading the book, the chapter two of the book by Marshall B. Gardner. Chapter two, the nebula and its evolution. Probably the most important concept in the whole realm of astronomy is that of the nebula. For it was only when the idea of the nebula as the original material of planetary evolution was advanced that astronomy could be put upon a really scientific basis. Until the actual genesis of solar system and planets could be accounted for in some measure, astronomy was merely descriptive. The credits for stating the nebula hypothesis goes to Kant and Laplace, who, however, based their speculations upon the law of gravity only. Since that day, the nebula hypothesis has undergone many modifications as actual observation of the heavens through telescopes and later through photographic means, to say nothing of our general knowledge of physics has progressed, how celestial bodies are derived from nebula. The latest modification of the theory of how other celestial bodies are derived from nebula is the one proposed in this book, that the reader may understand both the original theory and the chain of logic and observation by which this new theory grows out of it. We shall briefly summarize the older ideas, giving the scientific authorities for them and showing how these authorities have gradually worked to a point, without knowing it, of course, where our theory and ours alone fits all their facts and draws them together in a consistent explanation of what is actually happening in the heavens as the stars form and go through the immensely long life cycle. A spiral nebula, showing the central nucleus, projecting masses of nebulous matters, which forms a ring or wall around the central body, as clearly shown in the accompanying reproduction of a ring nebula. The ring, or hollow shell nebula in Lyra, was evolved from masses of nebulous matter, showing the polar opening of the central sun and the central sun, which will finally evolve itself into a new planet. Here you can see a planetary nebula with a star in the center. And uh, this is what Wikipedia has to say about uh, ring nebula, about the ring nebula. I quote, The ring nebula, also catalogued as Messier 57, M57 or NGC 6720, is a planetary nebula in the northern constellation of Lyra. Such objects are formed in small or ionized gases expelled in the surrounding interstellar medium by a red giant star, which was passing through the last stage in its evolution before becoming a white dwarf. So Wikipedia tells us that this planetary nebula with a star in the middle is the result of a dying star, a so-called red giant that exposed all its matter to become a yellow dwarf star. How can official astronomy dictate this theory as truth? I believe planets and stars are formed all the time in our galaxy and universe. This is an ongoing process, never ending. The material bodies of the stars and planets that are formed also have a certain lifespan. But that the souls of the planets, the higher dimensional aspects of the planets, and st of stars and planets are eternal. Pretty much as our souls are eternal, the souls of the planets are eternal. Of course, you have to know that this goes over periods of millions of years. The universe is eternal but its higher density counterpart is subjected to the laws of creation and nature, death and rebirth, natural cycles. So what again is a planetary nebula? Around 1,500 planetary nebulae have been detected. Official science states that these planetary nebulae 
come into existence when a star the size of our sun, a yellow dwarf star, apparently explodes and it generates a planetary nebula. But what if these are not all dead stars, but stars or planets that come into existence, as Marshall B. Gardner postulates in his book? I am no astronomer, but the theory that official astronomers put out is the theory that they want you to believe. Pretty much as official history compared to revisionist history, or official physics compared to ether physics or uh, Nikola Tesla, or um, the truth about central banking and the truth about this economy compared to the official economy that you learn at the universities, so it is the same with astronomy. Here too, the astronomers are focused on postulating that suns of different classes are of different ages because they believe that the suns evolved to become other suns in the course of millions of years. We have, we have had just a glimpse at the universe from our world in its enormous lifespan. How can, you, how can we assume that stars go nova? As an example, of course, we have observed this. Um, all the theory that they postulate over the stars and its evolution is comparable to official archaeology and anthropology that state that we have evolved from some monkey-like being millions of years ago. Again, I'm just scratching the surface here and we'll keep making videos on this topic, maybe make a series out of it. Now we'll check out some planetary nebula and try to think of what it could be and what it's actually forming. Here we see the planetary nebula that is named Katz's Eye. As you can see, it has a star in the middle and an, and an incredible amount of gaseous cloud around it that is most likely in a rotary motion around the star. As you can see there, there are two openings at opposite ends to each other. This will be the openings to the hollow planet that it will evolve to, comparable to the north and southern openings on the Earth. Well, just imagine the evolution of this planetary nebula to a possible star by being encapsulating a smaller star. As you can see in the picture, most of the nebulas have stars in the midst. They are beautiful nebulas, but official astronomy states that this is uh, the end of some star the size of our sun. But what if Marshall B. Gardner is correct? What if we are witnessing the birth of a planet, or the birth of stars, or even the birth of entire solar systems in the making? What if these planets are holoids with an inner earthen sun, uh, that even stars are holoids? Again, I am no expert. To study the truth on astronomy takes time, as much time as you have invested to find out the truth about World War II and the Third Reich. Only that this time there wouldn't be these alternative sources, you would have to study it on your own by looking it through a telescope. It takes weeks and months to, re to research revisionist history as a comparison. I believe it would also take months of research and study on your own for a real telescope to come to possible insights on how the universe came into being, on how it really works. Well, um, I spoke about chapter 1 and chapter 2 of A Journey to the Earth's Interior by Marshall B. Gardner. Um, I might make a, a series out of this. I hope that you enjoyed this video and, well, see you next time. Cheers! Aww.